So uh, today I'd like to, first of all, uh, acknowledge a debt of gratitude, and that's to Secretary Chu uh, and Arun Majumdar and uh, Ramesh uh, and uh, the Department of Energy for really inspiring, I think, uh, the latest generation of students. What we, uh, I have here a list of students on my first slide, uh, and former students and people who are young, young people and young people at heart who uh, really are the people that will drive this field forward. And these are people who are very, very smart people that have the options to do many different things, to go into other academic fields, uh, to go into healthcare, finance, inter information technology. They've chosen to dedicate their lives to this field, uh, partly because of your leadership and inspiration uh, and I think that's the thing that makes me most profoundly optimistic about the future. Um, so what I'd like to do is to talk about solar energy conversion at the thermodynamic limit. I'm the uh, academic representative on the podium today, and so I'm going to actually stretch beyond the sunshot goals and ask questions, uh, what are the ultimate limits to photovoltaic conversion efficiency, and how can we get very, very close to those limits? I'm going to talk about uh, the role of light trapping structures, and how we could surpass what were previously imagined limits. And I think the point there is just a lesson that sometimes when a community, even a community of scientists, establishes a limit, uh, that is not necessarily a, a fixed uh, for all time. Thermodynamics is fairly fundamental, but uh, there are, there are uh, new developments uh, that have changed people's way of thinking. Uh, and I'll talk about things that have to do with uh, essentially the more uh, thrifty use of photons, uh, uh, striking solar cells, and ways in which we can uh, manipulate the entropy of photons uh, in ways that can benefit uh, efficiency, and then finally stretch to what we could call ultra-high efficiencies. Um, and so, as I mentioned, you know, the, 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 the people that really have done the work are, are listed here on the right-hand side of my slide at Caltech and at uh, to uh, uh, commercial entities, Calix and Alta Devices, both of which are represented here. And I also uh, have had a long-term collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Nate Lewis at Caltech and Albert Pullman in the Netherlands. Um, so I think we can think about photovoltaic research and development broadly in, in, uh, in three ways. Uh, we can think about, first of all, there's an enormous amount of effort and uh, ingenuity and magic and uh, chemistry and solid state physics that goes into creating the materials. Uh, and that's an absolutely vital prerequisite. In fact, the technologies that are commercial today had the foundations laid for their technologies essentially at the inception of the what was then the Solar Energy Research Institute established in uh, the uh, mid-1970s, which later became NREL. Uh, and it's the legacy of those materials that is with us today in the technologies that are commercial. Uh, once you have materials, then there's a, there's a very, uh, you know, innovative and exciting period of device design where you can really understand the uh, way in which the material can be manipulated and uh, structured so as to facilitate the landscape for flow of electrons and holes. But there's another domain that has had less attention until recently, and that's the role of photon management. And uh, that's a regime that we have begun to explore uh, and that I think has a lot to offer uh, for all of the materials that are being explored for photovoltaics and give us an opportunity to go beyond current records and to go beyond some of the uh, previously imagined limits uh, uh, for photovoltaic conversion efficiency. And I'm going to concentrate today on things having to do with trapping light, essentially making materials more absorbing, uh, ways in which we can manipulate the directions of photons. That turns out to be important. It's something that we do in concentrating photovoltaics uh, uh, without thinking about it uh, too explicitly quite often. Uh, and then also uh, using the solar spectrum in a more uh, efficient way, spectrum splitting, which is something we also do in multi-junction cells, but we'll explore where there might be some uh, interesting directions to go in the future with that. So um, I'll consult one of my favorite philosophers, uh, unlike Yogi Berra, it's Arno Sommerfeld, who uh, opined that thermodynamics is a funny subject. The first time you go through it, you don't understand it at all. The second time you go through it, you think you understand it, except for one or two small points. The third time you go through it, you know you don't understand it, but by that time you're so used to it, it doesn't bother you anymore. Uh, so thermodynamics is embedded deeply in photovoltaics and in, uh, in essentially all energy systems, so it's wise to pay attention to it. 
Um, and indeed, what we can find if we go back to just the original conceptions using uh, detailed balance to imagine the uh, limits to photovoltaic conversion efficiency that were framed by Shockley and Kweiser in 1961, that fundamentally the, the thing to pay attention to is the balance of the absorption and emission of sunlight. Uh, and fundamentally, we can cast that into a thermodynamic picture by thinking about the free energy uh, that uh, is uh, associated with the absorption and emission process. And from that, we can uh, draw some conclusions about the way in which the operating voltage can be affected by the design of solar cells. Uh, for one thing, we have just the balance, of course, so spatially between absorption and emission. In the band picture, we can think about that as interchanging energy between photons and electron hole pairs and then vice versa. And there's a very deep reciprocal relationship, for example, between solar cells and light emitting diodes. A good uh, solar cell makes a good LED and a great uh, LED makes a great solar cell. So, if we think a little bit further, we can think about the free energy as then being composed of not only just uh, charge separating uh, the, the electron hole pair at the band edges of the semiconductor. If that were the case, the operating voltage and the open circuit voltage of a solar cell would be equal to the band gap energy, and it's not. Uh, there are some other factors that come into play that are fundamentally belie um, uh, entropic uh, con uh, 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 concepts in uh, thermodynamics that have to do with the loss of directivity uh, in the spontaneous emission of photons, uh, incomplete light trapping, low quantum efficiency, and these are the things that essentially separate us from achieving uh, the Shockley-Quaser limit. Uh, and by the way, I should mention that there are many areas of photovoltaics that uh, are, are very exciting uh, that are uh, looking in uh, research directions to surpass the Shockley-Quaser limit. But if we simply set as a goal to uh, attain the shockley quasar limit, we'll see that we can see, uh, achieve some dramatic results. And by the way, this is not just a theoretical construct that I can write down in an equation. This is a nice plot from Richard King from Spectrolab that illustrates the relationship between the open circuit voltage uh, versus the band gap. And the open circuit voltage um, is uh, given by the, uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 points that are essentially increasing uh, proportional to the band gap, but there's an offset. Uh, and the red triangles at the bottom illustrate that uh, across a wide range of materials whose band gaps range from around uh, six tenths of a volt up to almost two volts, uh, all high quality materials, that there's still this offset and it's about 400 to 500 millivolts. And that is the result of those uh, entropically related terms that I uh, described on the last slide. So these are real limitations. And of course, you can see, for example, as the band gap becomes smaller, it be this open circuit voltage offset from the band gap uh, robs you of more and more energy uh, for photovoltaic conversion efficiency. So in addition to Arno Sommerfeld, we can consult another philosopher uh, and uh, who opines that uh, the world requires crazy ones, rebels, troublemakers, the ones who see things differently. Uh, while some see them as crazy ones, we see genius. And indeed, those uh, people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So we're going to sort of think a little bit and, and, and kind of dream about directions that we might go, uh, uh, consulting, standing uh, equally on these two feet, uh, grounded in thermodynamics, but trying to think uh, in somewhat uh, unconventional directions as well. So we can then think about the uh, question of why the photovoltaic uh, conversion efficiency of a solar cell is not 93 percent, the Carnot efficiency. Uh, and there are a variety of reasons that uh, uh, relate to the physical processes that separate us from the conventional efficiency of solar cells. Uh, and there are many of them are related to the processes I described in the thermodynamic uh, construction of the uh, operating voltage. Then there's a huge bar, that big light blue bar, which has to do with the thermalization of carriers. That means that uh, the typical, uh, the fo most of the photons that strike uh, a solar cell strike it with more energy uh, than even the band gap energy, and that energy is lost as heat. And that's a huge uh, efficiency potential uh, that is uh, being exploited, uh, and I think it's one that, as we think about future directions, is one we should think about very hard as well. Uh, and indeed, there's a huge opportunity to span the, the, the gap between current, uh, even record efficiencies uh, and, and the ultimate limits. Uh, and so I'll come back at the end to propose that we should be setting our targets not at 15 or 20 percent, 
but really at 50 to 70 percent as the photovoltaic conversion efficiency that we should be thinking about uh, as, as, as noble goals. And the approaches that we'll take are to look at ways that we could manipulate uh, the uh, angular distribution of photons uh, in ways in which we can use wavelength scale structures to uh, trap light more efficiently and uh, using fun, uh, different physics in the wave optic regime uh, than is true uh, for thick cells, for example, wafer thickness cells that operate uh, by fundamentally ray optic principles. Uh, and then the notion of using uh, essentially optically parallel multijunction cells, while multijunction cells do exist in today's technology and they are the most efficient solar cells, uh, I feel like we need to give ourselves a little bit of freedom to think about how we might go even further. Uh, instead of two, three, four junctions, why not uh, six, eight, 12, 15 uh, junctions? And, and uh, sort of at least set out conceptually uh, the way forward for doing that. Um, so first to light trapping. If we think about light trapping, uh, in any uh, absorbing material, there's some portion of the solar spectrum that is absorbed completely, given by the shaded region under the uh, solar uh, spectral current density uh, versus wavelength here. And then there's a region of, uh, for any semiconductor uh, in the, of a absorber of non-infinite thickness where the absorption is less than uh, the, that required to completely absorb the solar spectrum. And it falls off dramatically near the band gap. Uh, so we can think about the, uh, uh, the ways in which we might increase the absorbance and one simple way, and this was articulated by my uh, friend and, uh, uh, and uh, scientific and commercial partner, Eli Yablonovich, uh, about uh, 25 years ago, was to note that if we simply uh, use Snell's law to sort of think about the way in which we populate modes inside a slab, a sort of sheet-like slab of material like a wafer, uh, we would only populate a, a limited fraction of the modes given by the angles subtended uh, by the incoming photons. If we simply texture the surface, we can increase the number of modes that are populated and increase thereby uh, the absorption, the intensity inside the material and the absorption. And that essentially uh, was an argument set forward by Eli and uh, George Cody, uh, when both were back at Exxon uh, Research, um, to uh, set a limit to, for ray, in the ray optic limit for absorption of light. Uh, and indeed, we can see then that this allows us to absorb more light at a given thickness, or if you set as your goal to absorb a certain fraction of the achievable, maximum achievable photocurrent in a solar cell, we can use principles like this to reduce the thickness. And that, of course, reduces the cost, the complexity, uh, the weight, and so forth of uh, photovoltaic devices. It's a very desirable thing to do. Um, so one, uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples, uh, some of my favorite examples of ways in uh, light trapping can be used. And one is to dramatically uh, perturb the aspect ratio of a solar cell uh, and by growing an array of micro wires. Uh, and this is done by a uh, vapor liquid solid growth process where we directly grow wires by a chemical vapor deposition process using a catalyzed growth process uh, to make arrays of wires, a sort of carpet of wires, uh, that can then be turned into solar cells by first a cleaning process, uh, growing, uh, doing typical semiconductor processing, uh, infilling a polymer that allows us to mask uh, and uh, define a PN junction uh, and uh, uh, diffuse a junction, then use typical solar cell processing of depositing anti-reflection and passivation coatings, which allow us to validate the uh, passivation of the surfaces, uh, and then finally to infill uh, light scattering uh, particles, dielectric light scattering particles that greatly increase the absorbance in this uh, polymer matrix. Uh, of, uh, in the silicon uh, of, uh, from, from the uh, light uh, impinging in the polymer matrix. Then we put a flexible transparent contact on top uh, and then peel it off. And indeed, uh, using this kind of technology, we can use uh, silicon, which is only a few percent of the uh, uh, equivalent uh, for, for, uh, for example, an array of wires that are of the order of 70 microns thick, we can use uh, a, a few percent uh, uh, packing fraction of silicon to achieve a planar equivalent thickness of, uh, of a few microns. Uh, and full absorption uh, would uh, dictate that you go a little bit thicker than that. But in any case, uh, the amount of silicon used is dramatically lower. Uh, and with this very small amount of silicon, it's possible to, in, uh, to absorb uh, essentially uh, most and close to all of the light. 
Uh, and at the single wire level, uh, it's been possible to validate that these uh, devices act like pretty respectable solar cells. Uh, and uh, so a, a current challenge for both development in the lab and uh, commercially is to uh, tr translate these uh, results uh, into uh, essentially a waferless solar cell process. And that's a theme that has pervaded a lot of our work. Uh, and so this is an, uh, one type of flexible uh, polymeric uh, solar material. Uh, in which wires are embedded in a polymer, and therefore the cell itself, even though it's a silicon solar cell, has the mechanical properties of a plastic bag, like a sheet of plastic before you uh, laminate it with uh, contacts and put it in an encapsulating layer. Uh, so that's one radical way to uh, affect light trapping. Another way uh, would be to increase the efficiency by adding uh, to this, uh, since the limiting efficiency of such a cell would be limited by the silicon efficiency, is to build a tandem. And this is a project that we're undertaking under the SunShot NextGen program uh, to uh, build tandem wire array structures by lattice matching uh, silicon germanium grown in the same process I just showed you uh, with uh, a, an overcoated uh, layer of epitaxial gallium arsenide phosphide. Uh, and so we've uh, begun uh, progress on that. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, a, a, uh, I think, an interesting direction for light trapping. Another direction for light trapping is to use highly scattering sub-wavelength scatterers. Uh, and that led us in the direction of using metals and high-index dielectric materials using, that uh, support, uh, that are conducting, that support plasmons. And so plasmonics is a, a field that uh, has been burgeoning in the scientific community. Uh, and in the area of photovoltaics, we've identified uh, several ways in which uh, highly scattering sub-wavelength uh, uh, particles like metal and uh, high dielectric constant particles could be used to enhance the efficiency of solar cells, either by scattering light in non-specular directions on the front of a wafer-based cell, and it's been shown that this can increase the efficiency of a silicon solar cell significantly over that for a uh, optimally AR-coded, planar AR-coded cell, uh, even with the macroscopic texture. Uh, you could uh, resonantly excite uh, these structures inside the cell. This is the case, for example, for polymers, where it's uh, physically uh, possible to, to put the uh, structures inside. But more commonly for inorganic thin films like CIGS, cadmium telluride, uh, amorphous silicon, uh, the way you might do this is to use a uh, highly scattering structure on the backside as a mode transformer to transform incoming sunlight essentially into modes of a waveguide. So we uh, import principles from optoelectronics to make waveguides, uh, uh, make solar cells into waveguides. Uh, and so this is an example of such a process uh, applied for uh, amorphous silicon thin film uh, solar cell technology in which a uh, stamping process is used to produce sub-wavelength scale scattering patterns. Uh, and the process technology and growth structure is very similar to that that's used in a conventional amorphous silicon solar cell process. In fact, this is done with a uh, a semi-commercial process, uh, and to make a PIN solar cell essentially on top of a light scattering back reflector. And this back reflector acts as a mode transformer for the incoming sunlight. Uh, and we were interested in a scientific uh, study in understanding what, uh, although the uh, photovoltaics community has uh, widely assumed that randomly textured structures would produce the best light trapping, we're asking in the question of whether random is best. Uh, is random best or is uh, some, some uh, departure from randomness best? And you can make things uh, 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 depart from random either by changing the shape of the uh, uh, random structure itself or the correlations between the bumps and the random pattern. So the power spectral density of the roughness or the correlation of the scatterers. And what we found was that, in fact, ordered structures outperformed, in terms of the photocurrent and efficiency, random structures. And so this turned on its head sort of a lot, many years of wisdom about how to do light trapping in thin films. Uh, we found that actually the, uh, if we make highly structured bumps uh, here shown in the random picture of a uh, random array of bumps in the middle, they're very quite similar in efficiency to the uh, uh, absorption and light trapping and efficiency to the ordered array on the right. So it's okay if the bumps are, have some lack of long range order, but it's very important that you make the bumps the right shape. Uh, and so a randomly textured glass structure like the Asahi glass turns out not to be optimal. Uh, and that's borne out. And, and so this resulted in a, a process reaching near record efficiencies. In fact, we've now gone up to very close to the world record for uh, 
uh, amorphous silicon single junction solar cells, but with a cell that is about two and a half to three times thinner than a normal amorphous silicon cell, 90 nanometers. And since the growth of amorphous silicon is one of the most costly uh, elements of the process, this is, an, I think, an, an important conceptual development. So I also want to highlight that uh, we're, get, we're beginning to be very quantitative, and we can use uh, full field uh, solutions to Maxwell's equations to be very quantitative in predicting the light absorption inside solar cells and to closely match between uh, performance of uh, uh, experimental devices and those that are designed using uh, theory. And in fact, uh, you can see here there's relatively close correspondence, and essentially the uh, calculations on the right were a prediction that were made before the experiments on the left of the spectral response were conducted for flat, randomly textured, and ordered structure. And you see there's not perfect correspondence, but what it indicates is these calculations are increasingly going to be used as design tools. So we have not only device design, but we have photonic design tools that will help us. And they can help us explain why solar cells uh, are efficient or inefficient in certain ways. So for example, we can use uh, uh, models of the bumps and look at the absorption. And for example, we can find that in the randomly textured uh, structures on the bottom, that the red spots uh, on the bottom layer, the silver, are the result of uh, sharp uh, spikes on the silver surface that act like little lightning rods that absorb uh, incoming light uh, and dissipate them as ohmic loss or uh, uh, heating of the metal, which of course is not what we want to do. Uh, and the more rounded bumps on the top uh, scatter the light rather than absorb it. The, the, the scattering efficiency is uh, much, uh, uh, much greater uh, the, uh, fraction of the extinction that, than the absorption, uh, and so we can fundamentally understand why uh, certain cells can be more efficient optically than others. Um, so what about this business about the, the light limits to light trapping? So as we go to thin films, when we have a, a, a cell which is not uh, the thickness of a wafer, which uh, where we can use uh, ray optical ideas, uh, structures bigger than the wavelength, when we go down to a thin film, the cell itself is of the order of a wavelength of light thick. So therefore, in that limit, we need to look at the energy in a solar cell as uh, manifest not only by the photon energy, but the density of modes, and that can be very different the density of uh, uh, allowed modes where the cell, uh, the light can live. Uh, and we know this from looking at waveguides and optical fibers that we use in our communication systems. Uh, and indeed, I won't go through this in detail, but basically this is just uh, 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 motifs for, for example, thin films of semiconductors, thin films with metal on the front, metal on the back, thin films with holes in them, and thin films that include things like antennas. And we can find that the density of modes in the absorbing part can dramatically depart from its value in bulk material. So there is, in, princ in principle, the potential to make materials much more highly absorbing per unit volume in thin films than in bulk materials. And so these are just some examples where thin film cells, and these are examples using polythiophene polymer uh, uh, solar cell materials, where uh, uh, the, the design of the structure allows you to beat the absorption in the ray optic limit. And so this is a, an exciting area that's challenging previous uh, uh, limits. This is a fully consistent with thermodynamics uh, and Maxwell's equations and so forth. But what it, is, it does say is that inhomogeneous materials can sometimes be more efficient than homogeneous ones. So to come back to Alta devices, you can ask the question, uh, how is it w w that it's possible to get uh, to uh, record efficiencies, and uh, if you have a very special semiconductor material like gallium arsenide, the, the, this is a material that is also a very efficient LED, and so when light is absorbed in the material, uh, electron hole pairs are created with high probability they are internally re-radiated, and just the spontaneous emission itself can effectively act like a scatterer. So I don't even need to texture the film, and I get the effect of randomly uh, populating light in the modes. Uh, and fundamentally, if I can now put a highly reflecting layer on the back of the cell, uh, then uh, those internally radiated photons then don't get absorbed in the substrate. So I will assert that the most efficient cells as we go forward in the future will all be thin film cells they, because they can exploit this optical advantage of confining the photons in the cell. So I look forward to seeing many uh, uh, people in the room who are working on PV devices to use these kind of principles. 
Uh, so Alta has achieved this thin film technology by peeling layers off uh, of the substrate in the video you just saw. Uh, here's an example, and there's uh, Chris Norris standing in front of the machine that's used to grow the thin films of the order of a micron thick. They're peeled off, uh, and it allows you to make cells of the, of the type I just showed you, where we can cycle the photons and achieve a very high open circuit voltage. Uh, and so the record uh, efficiencies at the cell level uh, that have now been uh, confirmed uh, by NREL are at 28.8 percent. The records keep changing uh, uh, week by week and month by month, um, with a thin film module efficiency record of 23.2 uh, percent. And there's uh, myself and Eli with a nice module created by the team. Um, so we can now think uh, further. Now, if we have a highly uh, radiatively efficient material like gallium arsenide, um, what could we do to improve the voltage uh, even further? So if we have a thin film uh, of material using the ray optics we described before, the light comes in in a cone. Uh, and if it scatters around in back, then light will emerge from the cell uh, if it's uh, within the cone uh, defined by the critical angle for reflection, total internal reflection from Snell's law. What if we could do something, uh, and, and so indeed the emission uh, which dictates the dark current and therefore also critically affects the open circuit voltage of a solar cell. What if we could manipulate the emission uh, from the cell by doing something like this? Uh, to put a parabolic uh, optic uh, on, the, on the front, uh, and in fact this is something that's done in concentrator solar cells all the time. Uh, but let's imagine we do this uh, with the solar, and, and we think about wh what's happening now. That means that the uh, light uh, emerging from the cell is emerging only from a smaller cone than it was uh, without the concentrator. So we can think about using these kinds of structures uh, in a one sun solar cell. So imagine we could produce a little tiny ray of, uh, uh, of uh, microstructures that would allow the light to come in and uniformly excite the semiconductor with carriers. Uh, but collimate the light uh, coming out so that as to reduce the dark current. Uh, and so you can imagine that if you had perfect uh, fluorescent material and perfect reflectors, that you could actually achieve efficiencies uh, exceeding 40% uh, at angle restrictions that correspond to these various levels of concentration shown. Well, of course, real materials don't uh, have fluorescence uh, and radiative efficiencies of one, uh, that are 100%. They're limited by Auger recombination in uh, uh, semiconductors, but it's possible to, with dielectrics to make the reflectivity pretty darn close to one. Uh, and we think there's an opportunity actually to go with one sun solar cells with such a structure up to efficiencies somewhere between 35 and 40 percent. Um, so here's, for example, what such a structure might look like. Uh, and these are microphotonic structures. These were made by a non-scalable process called two-photon lithography. Um, and they're about uh, 10 microns wide and 22 microns high, and we drill little holes in the bottom of them. Uh, so each one of them is a little microscopic version of a structure that you, uh, is used uh, in concentrating photovoltaics today on the macro scale. Uh, and this is what it looks like, uh, light beaming out of such a structure. These things, in fact, do collimate light, uh, and so they offer potential for creating a photonic layer even on one sun solar cells. Um, so finally, what might we do about the thermalization uh, challenge? So if we think about uh, carrier thermalization, in a single junction solar cell, uh, the photons above the band edge play a huge, uh, ha suffer a, a, a huge um, efficiency penalty, a photon uh, energy deficit right at the outset, even before we've uh, had to deal with uh, the entropy uh, uh, issues that we talked about before. Uh, so we can think of, and, and this is in fact, uh, the reason why, uh, one of the reasons why multi-junction cells are now among the most efficient cells. But let's dream a bit about ways that we might go even further with multi-junction cells. Uh, what we, the ideal multi-junction cell would be one where we could uh, optimally direct the portion of the solar spectrum uh, that is exact, exactly matched to the semiconductor band gap at exactly the right uh, solar in intensity for that cell, uh, generating exactly the right photocurrent for that cell regardless of the photocurrent in the other cells. Uh, and so that we would like then, to in, in, in principle, to be able to collect the currents independently uh, to focus the light independently on each subcell. So we can imagine then creating structures where uh, we have a, sol uh, a motif that consists of a spectrum splitting layer 
uh, and use some of the uh, liftoff techniques, for example, that Alta and many others have developed. For example, Semprius is another example of a company innovating in this area, where we can fundamentally manipulate thin film cells to create structures like the one shown uh, very uh, sort of schematically in the upper left corner, which in reality are essentially uh, optoelectronic integrated circuits, complex optoelectronic integrated circuits. You might say, well, that's going to be really expensive. Well, think about the fact that every other electronics and uh, pho pho uh, photonics technology started out as an expensive component, but somebody figured out, uh, bright people like the people on the first slide, uh, stayed up nights and weekends and figured out how to commoditize that technology. Uh, so what might seem uh, you know, very expensive today, uh, if you let your imagination run, you could imagine uh, being actually quite feasible. In fact, many of the things we're doing today looked expensive in the beginning. Uh, so we're, in fact, starting a, a project at Caltech, uh, and uh, we're building in the lab right now, this summer, a cell that looks like this. It's an eight-junction solar cell consisting of these uh, materials. This, by the way, is an idea with precedent. There have been other uh, uh, significant initiatives. There was a DARPA project uh, in this area a couple of years ago, and many lessons were learned from that, and I think we will benefit from the lessons of that project. But I think, I think this is a very interesting direction for the future to think about really uh, tailoring uh, photovoltaic architectures to really uh, exploit the opportunity from thermalization losses and overcome the thermalization penalty. So I think we can look forward, uh, if we do this right, uh, to setting our sights much, much higher to photovoltaic efficiencies uh, for single junction cells approaching 40% for multi-junction cells in the 50 to 70 percent range. And so even if we don't get there next year, I think if we set our sights that way, uh, that will uh, really uh, motivate us to think about things in a different way. Uh, so I, I will just conclude and say that the future of photovoltaics requires that basic science input. It requires the, uh, the, the, the really energetic young people uh, who uh, have been galvanized by interest in this technology and, and, and share your enthusiasm and really want to uh, push the boundaries. Uh, and high efficiency is enormously leveraging uh, as, uh, uh, as a way to reduce uh, overall cost because it reduces the cost of everything. It's the thing that's in the denominator of cost per watt. By control of quantum efficiency, radiative emission, light trapping, and efficiently utilizing the full spectrum. Of course, we have to achieve low cost. And, and to, for that will require large-scale nanostructure fabrication. I'm actually quite optimistic about that. Uh, recently, I was in a meeting where somebody showed me a 100-meter-long uh, web roll of nanostructures. Uh, so uh, for those of you that think that the making nanostructures is an academic enterprise, I don't think it will be. Uh, but these are the things that will enable us to get to, uh, uh, you know, not only to grid parity, but possibly well beyond uh, with unsubsidized cost and true energy supply significance. Thanks.